When most people think about human trafficking, they think about forced prostitution for good reason. There are 4.5 million women and girls in forced prostitution around the world. My first exposure to this was 30 years ago. I was living and working in Nepal. I was a public health officer, and my job was basically to translate resources into healthier people. At that time, we were finding girls that were 12, 13 years old who were HIV positive. Couldn't understand what was going on. So we went to go interview them. What we found was basically the same story we called over and over again. And it went something like this. Human trafficker, a guy around 20 years old, would go into a village and flash a bunch of money around. He wanted everyone to think he was rich. He'd then go find a girl, 12, 13 years old, befriend her, and then go to the family and say, I want to marry your daughter. They're thinking, wow, he's rich, he's handsome, he's going to take care of our daughter. But that isn't necessarily what's going to happen. A couple of days later, they actually go through the wedding ceremony. After that, he says to the family, I'm going to take your daughter to Kathmandu, the capital, but don't worry, I'll be back in three months. But instead, he takes her to Mumbai, India, to the red light district where the brothels are. He puts her in a room and he says, honey, stay here. I'll be back in a couple of hours. She's like, no, 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 no. When I came in, I saw these people. Who are they? Why are they dressed that? No, 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 it's OK. You just stay here. He then goes to the madam to get the $500 for having sold her to the brothel. He has the gold from the wedding, and he hands the wedding pictures over. He then returns to Nepal to do this again and again, maybe 40, 50 times in a year. The madam then goes into the room where the girl is and says, guess what? Your husband just sold you to me, and you're going to be with between 10 and 15 guys a day, every day. You can imagine her shock. No, 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 my husband loves me. No, this is what happened. When many of these girls internalize their situation, they say, I will kill myself before I do those shameful things. The madam then takes out the photograph of the wedding and says, is this your mother, your father, your brother? If you hurt yourself, we'll hurt them. So she's trapped in this situation where she's forced into prostitution. In order to make her into a prostitute, it's quite simple. You bring in a couple of professional rapists in over a two day period of time, they'll take this girl and rape her 30 or 40 times until eventually she just lays back and accepts whatever happens to her. After that, she's put on the line, which means she will be with between 10 and 15 guys a day, every day, until she gets what's called black eye, which is where she's so depleted spiritually and emotionally and physically that nobody wants her. So they throw her out onto the street. So I was hearing this story over and over again but I didn't understand the evil of it until I actually went to those brothels. I was invited by the government of India to do public health checks. I went from brothel to brothel. I had a policeman with me the entire time that I was there. I went into one brothel and there was an 11 year old trafficking victim. She saw this Caucasian guy, saw this opportunity, literally ran up and wrapped herself around me. Said, save me, save me, they're doing terrible things to me. I looked down at this child who was hysterically crying. I turned to the police officer and said, we need to get her out of here. He said, we can't do that. I said, what are you talking about? You're a cop. He said, if we try to leave, they'll kill us both. To make a long story short, we left. We came back with a lot more police, but of course she was gone. Now, I told that story because I wasn't one of those 15-year-olds that say, when I grow up, I want to be an activist. In fact, I did everything I could not to be one. But every once in a while, we are tested in life. That was my big test. I failed miserably. And for a long time, I had nightmares. I couldn't sleep. And I did what a lot of activists do. I surrendered to the fact that now that I know about this, this is what I'm going to do with my life. 30 years later, here I am presenting to you. But it's not just about women and girls. We have men and boys. The typical scenario in Southeast Asia, a 15-year-old boy is told he can go on a fishing boat. The boat's only going to go out for a couple of months. He's going to make a lot of money. He's going to come back. He's going to be a hero for his family. He gets on the boat. He doesn't realize because he's been sold onto the boat. The boat goes out, but it doesn't come back after three months. It stays out for four years. This poor kid will have to work 17, 18, 19 hours a day every day. If he doesn't, he gets tortured and beaten, food's taken away. The only food he will have the entire time he's there is rice and fish, nothing nutritious. He will have, be given drugs that stimulate his body. If he gets injured, if he gets sick, 
They throw him off the side of the boat. At the end of the four years, uh, the boat comes back. He goes to the captain and says, give me something. The captain says, go away. You're illegally in our country. Guy says, I'll tell the police. The captain says, go ahead. We own the police. I'll give you one more example. I lived and worked in Bangladesh for five years. And during the time that I was there, we had infants, two-year-olds, who were trafficked from Bangladesh to the Middle East. Now, those of you who have parents know that a two-year-old doesn't have the manual dexterity or the concentration to do repetitive work. What do you do with a two-year-old? You put them on the back of a camel. Why? Because if you put a two-year-old on the back of the camel, they kick and scream. What does the camel do? It runs. So they race camels, and they bet on them, and they use infants because they are light. By the time the child is five years old, assuming they live to that age, because many of them fall and get trampled, He's beginning to gain weight. He's slowing the camel down. So they take this kid and throw him out um, into the real world to fend for himself. So at a time when most five-year-olds are beginning their life, you have a five-year-old boy by himself in a situation where, for the most part, he has to fend for himself. All of these things that we're talking about fall into the category of what we call human trafficking. Now, let's talk about human trafficking for a moment. Human trafficking was the terminology that was used because in the early days, we had a situation where a person was going from one country to another as examples of what this phenomena was. And so they said we needed a rubric that showed movement. So like drug trafficking, where, where drugs are taken from one place to another, uh, or arms trafficking, taking from one place to another, human trafficking was the terminology. But over time, what people realized was a situation where, wait a minute, does it matter if a person goes from one country to another, or from one city within a country to another, or from one side of the street to another? Isn't it more of a relevance that if a person doesn't get paid, if they can't leave, if there's violence and threats, shouldn't we focus on the exploitation? So over time, what happened is human trafficking was switched over to slavery. But then people said, well, wait a minute. Slavery happened a long time ago. So they put the word modern next to it. So human trafficking is the means to which a person gets into the outcome, which is modern slavery, and we're hearing about that uh, all over the world. So, okay, so we have slaves in the world. Some people might ask the question, well, we may have some in Africa, Latin America. There's got to be a few thousand of them. Actually, there's a lot more than that. There's over 40 million people in modern slavery. In fact, there are more slaves today than any other time in history more slaves today than any other time in history. 62% of them are here in Asia, basically for two reasons. There's a lot of Asians. China, 1.37 billion people. India, 1.27 billion people. Then you have Pakistan, Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, all have large populations. Second, you have remnants of feudal systems that have never been completely dismantled all across Asia. You go to Beijing, very high, very a uh, well-running uh, modern city, go 20 kilometers outside, and what you will find are these feudal systems that exist that exploit people that have been there for, for almost ever. When it comes to the 40 million, we have it broken down into a couple of subsets. About 38% of them is forced marriage. This is where people are forced to enter into a marriage to work. And 62% of them would be in forced labor. And then when you break that down again, you find that 19% of them would be in forced prostitution, 64% in more traditional fishing boats, agriculture type situations. And so we're able to now count and look at the numbers of people who are in these circumstances, and that gives us a general sense of what the problem is. Another thing that's really interesting about this is the fact that with all of the variations on human trafficking, in some cases you have things that are more labor related, like fishing boats and sweatshops, and others that have less of a labor and emphasis, forced marriage or begging, or you have a situation where an individual, like a domestic helper, is by themselves, or you have people in a situation where they're working in a sweatshop with many other people. Because of this variation, it's very difficult to come up with interventions in order to address modern slavery. In terms of the number of people who are adding and uh, to this number over time, in a year, 9.2 million people. In a day, about 25,000 people. Or in the time it takes us to do this presentation, approximately 1,000 people will enter modern slavery around the world. 
The last statistic that always gets me is that there's a new slave every four seconds. One, two, three, four. Somewhere in the world you have somebody entering into modern slavery and the drug beats on and on and on. When it comes down to a breakdown between kind of, kind of a forced prostitution and forced labor, most people think that what we're talking about here is forced prostitution because we hear that so often. But in reality, over 80% of what we're dealing with here is forced labor. And as it relates to us as consumers, 60% of that number are associated with the electronics, the footwear, the apparel, the food, the fish that we buy. So as consumers, we are contributing to modern slavery because of our consumer behavior. We don't always know when we're buying something that might be tainted by modern slavery, but for the most part, we've all contributed to that. And like the uh, kind of emphasis in the environmental movement of the carbon footprint being part of us, we also are contributing to human trafficking as consumers. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about how it is that people get into modern slavery. And the first one is deception. And this represents about 85% of what we're talking about. Imagine if you were a person and somebody came to you and said, I'll give you a million US dollars for a job. You only have to work four days a week. You can have two hours off for lunch. I'll give you a house, a car, three months of vacation, and you can live everywhere in the world you want. If it was real, everybody would be excited about that. It's a great opportunity. But most of us would be thinking, is this too good to be true? Well, in reality, most times it isn't. But imagine if you're in a situation where basically you are a migrant and you've never made more than two US dollars a day and somebody comes up and says, I'll give you four US dollars. And instead of working 16 and a half hours, you only have to work 15 hours and I'll give you two hours off on Sunday. But you have to make the decision right now. So maybe the person's thinking sounds too good to be true. But what if it isn't? What if it's that one time in a person's life when they get a break, the person can get a motorcycle, a tin roof, and so many people accept this, get taken away, and then they're forced into a situation. The second is debt. So in this particular situation, let's say a person needed $1,500 for an operation for their family member, Hong Kong dollars. Didn't have the money, went to a loan shark, borrowed the money. Operation took place, it was very successful. After that, he tries to pay the loan shark back with $2,000. $2,000? I need $20,000. Now, you may basically say, that's not fair. Well, what we're dealing with here are criminals. They don't have to be fair. So oftentimes, what happens is people get cheated in this indebted situation, and they get into a situation where, for the most part, they will be forced to, uh, to pay this back. They get to in a situation where they're made to basically work, and that's how they hold people in place. When it comes to kidnapping, a lot of us think that's how people get into human trafficking. It happens, but not very often, partly because if you trick or deceive or force a person into human trafficking against their will, and they're going kicking and screaming, uh, somebody might see it. So most people who enter into human trafficking are deceived. When it comes to the things that are used to address modern slavery, there are basically three interventions. The first one is prevention, and prevention is exactly what it sounds like. You try to prevent a person from getting into human trafficking. And so we have programs all over Asia that basically go and try to get migrants not to migrate from one place to another because of the potential risks that exist in there. But the problem with this approach is that most migrants who have been trafficked who come back lie about their experience. So it's very difficult to find somebody who's saying, yes, I did this, it got bad for me. And so as a result of that, a lot of people don't take the advice and guidance. The second is using legal systems to go after bad guys. The trouble with this is that human trafficking isn't one crime like a rape or a robbery or murder. It's multiple crimes that are put together. And there's almost formulas that have to be used to determine whether or not a person is a trafficking victim or not. And so it's very confusing for law enforcement. And so a lot of law enforcement people don't feel it's really their job to go after forced labor type situations. The last situation is protection. And in this, you basically have a person who is, has been trafficked. And afterwards, somebody comes and takes them to a shelter. Somebody helps them out. Somebody gives them the skills and the means to be able to move on with their life. All of these different interventions are used 
by the counter-trafficking world to address the issue. Now, when it comes to who's supposed to be addressing these problems, it's supposed to be governments. But a lot of governments don't like this topic. It's embarrassing for the government of Hong Kong or for Thailand or Cambodia or Indonesia to have slaves. Many of them do things, but not nearly the number of things that they need to do in order to make a difference. I worked for the United Nations for years. I'll put my hand on my heart when I say this. I believe in the United Nations system, but I spent a lot of time in five-star hotels, eating really good food, um, basically uh, talking about poverty. There was a real disconnect between what we were supposed to do and what we were actually doing. So the groups that are doing most of the work are the NGOs, the non-government organizations that are out there on the front lines, working with the victims, trying to shut down these programs and so forth. So if we stop and look at the statistics, 81% of what we're talking about is forced labor, and 60% of that is associated with supply chains. This is where our food comes from. This is where basically we get our electronics and so forth. Another group that has to be involved in this is the private sector. But if you think governments don't like this topic, the private sector hates it because they're often on the receiving end of somebody pointing a finger and saying, it's because of your greed that you would actually use slavery in order to get shareholder profits. In reality, this is not the case. Private sector would never do that, but consumers believe that, and that's a big problem for the private sector. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you the report card for the number of people who basically have been helped last year out of modern slavery. There's 40 million people. How many of them got out last year with all of the NGOs and governments and public sector activities taking place? Then I'm gonna show you out of a half million criminals, how many criminals basically went to jail? Think about what a good number would be. And here are the results. Last year, out of 40 million people, only 100,000 people were helped. That's 0.2% of the victims, not even 1%. Out of a half million criminals, you had a situation where only about 8,000 of them were put in jail, 0.8%. When you look at those statistics, you might ask the question, does the counter-trafficking world not care? Are they lazy or they're not doing what they're supposed to do? Well, that's not the issue. The issue is this. The profits generated from modern slavery are estimated to be 150 billion US dollars a year. The amount of money that's used to fight it is about 350 million, or 0.23% of the profits. To put this into perspective, in the United States, we eat a lot of potato chips. Six billion dollars worth of potato chips a year. It takes 21 days of potato chip eating in the United States to come up with the amount of money that's used globally to address modern slavery. So the profits are this big, the amount of money to fight it is this big. You can see what it is that we're up against. Another thing is the scale. There's only about 15,000 do-gooder types that work for the NGOs and the governments that work on this full time compared to a half million greed incentivized criminals. We have to follow rules and regulations. We have to do things according to a plan. If they find that anyone's coming after them, they can mutate and they can change in a millisecond. When it comes to this particular topic, when we present to the private sector, we often have people express disbelief. UNGO types are always coming up with these numbers. They don't believe it's actually happening. And if you have a, a receptive audience, then they will accept information. If they don't accept the premise that there's 40 million people, it's really difficult to convince them. And lastly, we have a situation where general awareness of this is very low. So if I were in front of an audience, I would ask how many of you knew even 20% of what I was talking about? And generally, I get very few hands because most people haven't been exposed to this. If you haven't been exposed to it, you're not going to care. If you're not caring, you're not going to do anything. So it's really important for people to have a better understanding of this particular modern slavery and how it works. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk about the private sector and the relevance of the private sector to forced labor. Now, a lot of the discussion that I'm gonna give you started as a result of that number, 0.2%. When governments in the United Nations uh, came to realize that basically the public sector was not having much impact on addressing modern slavery, 
they went back to the numbers and realized many of the people associated with forced labor were associated with supply chains. So they said, we have to bring the private sector in. As a result of that, what we saw is a situation where private sector was drawn in, not willingly, but through basically trends that created a business risk. Because most people felt like the only way you're going to get the private sector involved is if you create risk. So what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about some of the trends that we're seeing. The first trend is expanding legislation. So prior to 2012, we had a situation where periodically governments and businesses and the United Nations would come together, they would debate and discuss human rights issues, modern slavery, and then often they'd come up with a report and they'd put that report out, they'd pat each other on the back. It would be available, but very few people used it because there was no incentive to use it. There was no reason to do things. So gradually over time, we saw legislation that was introduced. The first legislation was the California Transparency and Supply Chain Act. What this act basically said is that if you're a big company and you have profits of $100 million in either retail or manufacturing, and you have a single product in California, you basically have to say on your website what you're doing to do to address modern slavery. If you're not doing anything at all, and you say that, you're in compliance, but you have to say something. The purpose of this legislation was transparency, to allow consumers basically to see what companies are doing or not doing. What happened a couple of years later is the UK Modern Slavery Act came in. What they did is they lowered the ceiling from 100 million to 36 million pounds, but they added two additional things. Number one, an annual report, and that annual report has to be signed by the board of directors. What that did is elevated this issue from the compliance level to the board level. And then we saw the French legislation came in, Australian legislation, and we see pending legislation coming in the EU and Canada. But the transition is from initially just having transparency to annual reports to a situation where it's becoming more punitive. The Canadian legislation is actually saying, if you are found to have forced labor in your business, you will be fined and penalized. We haven't seen that before. The second thing we're seeing is lawsuits. What we're seeing mostly are retailers who buy large quantities of possible commodities that are tainted with modern slavery being sued because they're doing that. And the plaintiffs want them to use their influence to make things better. In one case, there was actually a situation where the plaintiffs wanted there to be on the side of the tuna fish a clause that said this product could be tainted by modern slavery. Now, if you were a consumer, you went into a grocery store and picked that up, I don't think you're going to buy that product. So obviously, this creates a business risk for that organization. When it comes to the cocoa industry, they've been sued for years, partly because in Africa, where the beans come from, it's often fraught with child labor and forced labor circumstances. So a situation where lawsuits can get a lot of publicity is a business risk. It leads to the potential for naming and shaming. Another trend that we see is increased media coverage. What we're seeing is that articles and exposés related to modern slavery are nearly doubling every year for the past five years. Now, in the 1990s, you couldn't pick up a paper and not read something about HIV AIDS. Nearly every day we saw articles and exposés on that because it was a phenomena. It was a period of time that focused on that. When was the last time you saw an HIV AIDS uh, story? What happened is the environmental movement came and replaced that, did that for 15 years, and now the new issue of our time is modern slavery. So what we're seeing is that environmental coverage is going down, modern slavery is going up, because people are interested in the topic. They want to know about the topic. And so you will expect to see more and more of this over time. And this could last for quite some time. People want to get their teeth into it. People want to see what's being done to address it. Another one is that there are consumer groups that professionally work in order to name and shame companies into doing something. There's this one particular organization, I won't mention them, that has a list of 9 million people on their database. When they think that a company is doing something wrong, they send to each of those 9 million people a message saying, can you send an email or a letter to this company? In this particular case, uh, what we're seeing here is palm oil. And so this company went after a particular organization, got all of these people to send these emails. 
Imagine if you worked for that company, you had a great weekend, you come in on a Monday, you open up your email, and you find nine million angry emails. You can imagine that this isn't a good thing for that company, and it obviously has the potential to hurt their reputation. The last thing is the investment world. So for a long time, investment companies didn't care much about the world. And then there was a lot of emphasis on the environment and a lot of emphasis on our co companies fair to their employees and so forth. And so what was called ESG was set up. E is environmental, G is governance, S is social. The E and the G are fairly well established in that they have metrics to address this. But the S side never really had that much in the way of metrics. And so what are happening now is you're finding that teachers unions are beginning to ask the question, how do we know that our retirement fund isn't supporting modern slavery? So what we're beginning to see is an emphasis on companies asking the questions, how do we ensure that if we are investing in a particular manufacturer that there isn't a problem? And so the SDGs, the Sustainability Development Goals that are used to measure kind of the impactor things and the ESG are coming together. And there's an emphasis on trying to measure investments to ensure that there isn't any tainting associated with it in modern slavery. And the reason for this is simple. There's a large number of people who are millennials now who really do care about the world. In fact, 84% of the millennials say that they value the investments that they have. In addition to that, the millennials in the next decade are gonna be overseeing over $30 trillion in investment. And so as they move into this space, bringing their, uh, their morals and their ethics into it, you're gonna see more of an emphasis on this. So all of these things that we're talking about here have created an incentive for governments to get the private sector to be involved in addressing modern slavery. And this trend has kind of transcended the banking world, the retail world, the manufacturing world, the hospitality world. Modern slavery affects financial service providers in so many different ways. From looking at customer risk, industry risk, ESG and ethical investments, all the way through to understanding banks' own procurement supply chains. However, the number one issue, the key driver of all modern slavery activity, is profit. Modern slavery is estimated to generate 150 billion US dollars every single year in profit. That's 4,800 US dollars every single second made from the exploitation of men, women, and children around the world. Now, conversations about money laundering and strategies in your AML policies will often focus primarily on drug trafficking. It is the largest global crime, standing at around 300 billion US dollars a year. However, human trafficking is the second most profitable crime in the world today. Yet this crime tends to go undetected, underreported, and very much misunderstood by financial service providers. Around a quarter of all modern slavery victims are found within the commercial sex world. The remaining 75% are found within global supply chains. So these are the people that are making the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear, the electronics that we use every single day. Virtually no industry is immune from this issue. And every single country in the world is somehow affected. Now, the reason that criminals are able to make so much money from this crime is due to the fact that once they get someone under their control, they're able to exploit that person over and over and over again. It's a relatively high reward and relatively low risk crime. Now, these criminals are interacting with legitimate financial institutions every single day. They're using banks to make remittances. They're setting up fake businesses to launder funds. In some cases, they're even bringing victims to banks to open up bank accounts specifically for the purpose of using these accounts to launder the proceeds of modern slavery. Now, there is emerging legislation in this space, and this legislation is looking to target the banks directly. The End Banking for Human Traffickers Act in the United States 
is designed to close all bank accounts that are associated with any kind of modern slavery or human trafficking situation. Not only that, this act is going to look to penalize companies and individuals within those companies who have opened and maintained those bank accounts. Whether they knew about the nefarious activity or not, other pieces of legislation that affect banks include the UK and Australian Modern Slavery Acts. Now, these acts require organisations to publish a publicly available yearly statement that outlines exactly what they're doing to combat modern slavery in their operations. Customers are looking at these, they're reading these, and they're making judgments on organisations based on what they're doing to combat this crime. Failure to comply with such legislation can have completely devastating impacts on business. Banks are starting to see fines and penalties being levied against them for failing to comply with this legislation. Now imagine the immense reputational risk that's involved with being associated with a crime so horrendous as human trafficking and modern day slavery. Not to mention the naming and shaming that goes hand in hand with that in the media. And as a result, customers are moving their money out of the banks, you're losing investments, and there's a potential long-term impact on profitability. There are a number of steps that banks can take to address this issue better, and the Mekong Club supports with all of these elements of anti-slavery strategy. These cover training and awareness, typologies and indicators, risk profiling, screening, detecting and reporting, as well as engagement with multi-stakeholder initiatives. Training and awareness is absolutely fundamental to any organization's anti-slavery strategy. Your key decision makers at the top of the business need to understand exactly why their decisions are important. They need to understand the fact that their decisions can positively or negatively impact the lives of millions of people in the world. And then you've got your frontline staff, your relationship managers, your branch staff. They need to be trained on how to spot the physical red flags, red flags of suspicious behavior that could potentially save a life. And then furthermore, you have special departments within all banks that have responsibilities related to this issue that require specialist training. So think about your ESG investment team, your financial crime compliance team, transactions monitoring teams. Do they fully understand what they're looking for? Do they know how to identify potentially suspicious activity? And do they know how to escalate it? So again, lives can be saved. Typologies and indicators are absolutely crucial in identifying and furthering our understanding of modern slavery risk within finance. Banks need to understand who these criminals are, where have they come from, which industries are they operating in, and then very crucially, exactly how are they interacting with financial services today. Banks can share anonymized case studies, law enforcement can share typologies, Together, we can build a more collective understanding of how these criminal gangs are operating and, as a result, stop them from succeeding. With regards to typologies, it's really, really important to take into account the industry and country-level context. In the UK, a typology we might use would be looking at a high-risk business type, like a nail salon. Say this nail salon is making transactions at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Very unusual in the UK. Nobody's getting a manicure at night time in the UK. This could indicate potentially suspicious activity going on outside of the expected nature of that business. Now, this typology might work in London. However, if you try to take that typology and apply it to certain cities in Asia, it simply won't work. It's not particularly unusual to get a manicure at one o'clock in the morning in some places. So you can see the need for dedicated typologies for particular regions, countries, industries that can be disseminated and understood and contributed to by all financial institutions. Understanding where the risk actually lies in your client book is really, really important in order to craft an appropriate response. There are a number of data sources out there that look at modern slavery risk. So for example, the Global Slavery Index covers prevalence risk by country. It can tell you how many people are estimated to be in modern slavery in any given location for that year. The US Department of Labor publishes a list of goods and services 
that it knows to be tainted by child and forced labor. Incorporating these kind of data sets into your risk rating methodologies strengthens them and also ensures that you're taking into account modern slavery risk. Now, of course, this kind of risk profiling needs to be coupled with adequate training. So those responsible for these high risk customers know how to monitor and mitigate this risk appropriately. As you know, screening is vital. Screening uh, current customers, screening potential customers, ongoing screening of negative news and negative facts of customers tends to form an integral part of any kind of anti-money laundering system. But modern slavery is a complex crime. It's kind of an umbrella term that covers many different crime types. You've got human trafficking, child labor, indentured servitude, and so on. All of these terms, all of these terminologies need to be built into this screening process to ensure that you're picking up everything that you can be related to modern slavery. And again, those responsible for dealing with any screening hits need to understand what it is they're looking at. They need to understand these definitions, what they mean and how to deal with them. In order to eradicate this crime, in order to stop modern slavery from being as profitable as it currently is, we need to be detecting and we need to be reporting more concrete cases. We need to make, be making it impossible for these criminals to be interacting with the financial systems as easily as they do. In order to do this, we need to bring in typologies, we need to bring in trainings, we need to bring in all of these elements, we need to operationalize them into bank systems. We need to have systems in place to monitor suspicious transactions. We need to have clear escalation procedures in place that clearly define modern slavery concerns to ensure they're being escalated to law enforcement and people are being put in prison. And finally, multi-stakeholder initiatives are crucial. No one organization is going to end this issue alone. At the Mekong Club, we hold regular financial service working group meetings where banks can get together, they can share with their peers, they can share best practice, they can discuss the challenges that they face in combating this issue. We come together, we discuss modern slavery, and we decide on collective responses because the sum of our voices is greater than any one. We are the Mekong Club. We are a catalyst for change, engaging, inspiring, and supporting the private sector to lead in the fight against modern slavery. We are a Hong Kong-based NGO. We work with organizations in a positive, collaborative, non-naming and shaming way to identify opportunities for change. We have a business association of four working groups that cover financial services, hospitality, retail and apparel and footwear, as well as a number of cross-sector industry initiatives. Together, we convene these groups on a regular basis. We create a safe space for companies to come together to share best practice, to share the challenges and the roadblocks that they're facing when it comes to combating this issue. We work with these companies to develop tools, resources, innovative projects designed to tackle these challenges and move forward their industries as a whole. Our corporate tools are available for our members and they're designed to guide companies through a journey when it comes to combating modern slavery. We start by understanding modern slavery. Often companies need to start here because they need to know what this issue is, how it affects them, how it affects their industry, and the steps that they should be taking in order to combat it. Next, we work with companies to enhance and develop very specific policies and procedures to combat modern slavery. We work on their road mapping, their anti-slavery strategies, and we review documents to ensure their business response is as strong as it should be. Modern slavery is pure profit. We want to crowd out these bad actors. And to do that, we sit with companies and we assess and mitigate the risks that they find within their operations. We work with companies to understand where the risk lies. We help them carry out investigations and develop remediation plans to ensure that if and when they do find issues, they are dealt with appropriately and with victim care at the very center of everything that they do. 
We want to build capacity for companies. We work to develop their employees' skills. We train them, we develop them. We want them to become proactive in leading the fight against modern slavery, not just reacting to issues that have already happened. And finally, every single member of the Mekong Club should become an industry leader in this space. We work with companies, we get them to share best practice. They demonstrate to their peers that modern slavery can be eradicated without an impact on profitability. I'm now going to walk you through some highlights of our tools and resources that we have available to members at the Mekong Club. We have an e-learning platform. So this is a comprehensive platform of videos available in multiple languages. They are short videos coupled with infographics and quizzes designed to teach employees what modern slavery is, key legislation, terminology, testimonials from survivors, as well as very specific information on how this issue affects their industry. These videos are available in multiple languages. They're being used by companies in countries across the world. And also companies are able to use these videos to help educate their suppliers. We have developed a knowledge hub now, this is a carefully curated library of resources and news articles related to modern slavery. We update this on a regular basis, and it provides you with the most relevant, the most up-to-date information related to this issue. You can go into the Knowledge Hub, you can search by keyword, by country, by commodity, to find what you need quickly and easily. We also provide our members with monthly digests of the most relevant news and resources every single month straight into their inbox. Our transparency in supply chains legislation tool breaks down the very complex world of modern slavery legislation into bite-sized pizzas. It gives summaries of the legislation and what the expectations are on your company in order to comply. It outlines exactly who is affected, what the requirements are for reporting, as well as any potential penalties for non-compliance. Crucially, we also provide best practice examples and common mistakes that companies make when they're adhering to this legislation to ensure we're improving as an industry as a whole. Our remediation toolkit has been developed to prepare companies. Chances are you are going to find risk or issues within your operations related to modern slavery. You need a plan in place to deal with this. Our remediation toolkit guides you through preparing a remediation plan, and communicating this plan effectively with key stakeholders, so your suppliers, your employees, workers in supply chains. It then guides you on how to investigate potential cases of modern slavery and then remedy them in such a way where your business continues to thrive, but you also continue to support those victims that have been found within supply chains and ensure this issue does not arise in the same way ever again. At Mekong Club, we are passionate about generating thought leadership, about furthering the anti-slavery conversation between ourselves, our peers, and other organizations. We take our projects and we assess them on a regular basis. We report on what works, what doesn't work, where we think anti-slavery strategy is going in the future. All of our thought leadership and our research pieces are available online. Increasingly, asset managers and investors are starting to care about this issue. ESG investment is designed to measure whether or not a company or investment can be considered to be ethical. Well, currently, modern slavery within the S or social element of ESG is really lacking. We have come up with a set of indicators that can be used to assess a company's performance in their anti-slavery strategy, ESG indicators. These have been designed to be used by asset managers and to really reward those companies that are taking these steps in combating slavery. We have a number of technology-based innovation projects that we have developed in response to the challenges and the issues put forward by our working groups. Our research indicates a number of problems with the social audit process as it stands. Currently, when a social auditor goes into a factory to interview a worker, they may be interviewing them in front of a room of 20 of their peers, also potentially in a language that is not the first language of that particular worker. This makes it quite challenging to get the information that they need. And it also means there are privacy issues, as workers may not feel comfortable 
to talk about the reality of their situation when in front of their peers or even their management, especially in the case where they might be in a forced labour situation. The AppRise Audit app has been developed to combat this. So the auditor can bring the app into a factory or a location where they're looking to interview workers. The workers are given a headset and they're able to listen to questions that have been developed in line with the ILO indicators of forced labour and answer on a phone in a private way. This data is then aggregated and any red flags are displayed so that follow-up action and remediation action can take place. Another issue that we found within the kind of auditing process that's been put forward by our working groups is that of migrant worker employment documentation. We have instances where workers' employment contracts are confiscated, they might be uh, changed, or they might not even exist at all. So we've developed the Emin app. Now this is a blockchain-enabled solution that allows for the recording and sharing of key mi migrant worker documentation using blockchain technology. It empowers the workers with a copy of their own information that they wouldn't necessarily otherwise have. And it also moves us away from a very heavily paper-based process that's prone to fraud, that's prone to error, or that's prone to abuse. Join the Mekong Club to tap into our network of industry experts. We can come to your offices. We can educate your staff on these issues. We can talk with your senior leadership and explain to them just how important their decisions are. We can review your policies, procedures, your anti-slavery strategies and you will join a network of individuals that are experts in this field. We learn from each other, we share best practice, we share examples, and we learn and grow together. The Mekong Club is dedicated to uniting and inspiring the private sector in the fight against modern slavery. Join us, join our network, sign up your company to our working groups. Together, we can end modern slavery. I'd like to conclude with a story. This story will put into perspective kind of my feelings about what is modern slavery and what needs to be done to address it. So years ago when I was living and working in Nepal, I desperately wanted to do something to help, so I decided I was going to write a book. As part of this book writing process, I went from shelter to shelter to interview the women and the girls in order to get the information that I needed. I went to one shelter and there was a girl named Gita and every time I approached her, she said, no, 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 I don't want to talk to you. But she sat and listened to all of the other kind of discussions that I had. When I, when I finished up there, I stood up and I was walking towards the door. And Gita comes running up and says, I changed my mind. You can have my story. I was thrilled. Gita sat on one side of the table. The rest of us sat on the other side of the table. And over a three-hour period, she told the worst story I had ever heard related to modern slavery. It was filled with rape and torture and disease and betrayal. She said she was raped 7,000 times and that she was dying of AIDS. At the end of this story, I honestly didn't know what to say. I paused. Finally, I turned to her and I said, Wow, Gita, you must be so angry at those human traffickers for the horrific things they did to you. She paused and paused. And she said, no, I'm angry at you and you and you. She pointed at us. She said, where were you? So that every single day she woke up praying for somebody to come and help her. Nobody came. She said she went to school till she was 12. She knew that everything around her was right out in the open. Nobody was doing anything about it. She said she wasn't angry at the traffickers. She said they're just bad people being bad people. She said she was angry at the good people at society for not caring enough to allow a young girl to be commercially raped 7,000 times. Now I tell this story because Gita inherently understood that in order to address this issue, it's not going to be a small number of people. The issue and the problem is too big. and We need everyone to come together. And so at present we have the NGOs and we have the governments and we have kind of the United Nations. But what we're trying to do now is to add the private sector. Why? Because the private sector has something to offer. You have the skills, the means, the problem solving, ability, 
the resources, the networks to make a difference. And so we, the Mekong Club, believe that we should be working with the private sector in a positive, supportive way because we recognize the potential that the private sector has. And so that's part of the reason why we emphasize private sector involvement, because we're only helping 0.2% of the victims. We need to get that up to 2%, then up to 20%. We need to make a difference, and we need the private sector to be a part of that process. But I also say to people that after listening to this talk, there are things that you can do. And I often ask my audience to do one thing. If they do one thing in a year, they're doing something. Now, people might ask, what is it that I can do? Well, one thing you can do is to learn about this issue. Guess what? You watched this video. You learned about this. You've done your one thing. You don't have to go out and do anything else. How easy was that? But if you were to stop and tell two other people what you've done, you've done a second thing, and a third thing, and a fourth thing. So it's easy to contribute. You don't have to quit your job and go to Cambodia and work in a shelter. There are simple things we can all do. Another thing is within your company, participate in the discussions and the meetings to address this particular issue related to modern slavery. You can volunteer. You can basically go and work for an NGO in your community. You can do it in their office or you can do it remotely. Even doing internet searches in order to collect information is a viable thing that you can do. These are all small things that add up. You can use your innovative skills. If you are a technical person, you can help with app development, the application of technology, design issues, any number of things you can do. You can give a donation. A small donation given to an organization can make a big difference. For example, in Cambodia, it costs about three US dollars a day to keep somebody in a shelter. Maybe the state will pay for two weeks. Maybe they need another two weeks. A small contribution, giving up a meal, taking that money and donating it makes a difference. Or you can fundraise within your organization. All of these things add up if lots of people do it. And I often say if 10 million people did these types of activities, that's 10 million compassionate, supportive gestures that adds up to something quite big. Now, the last thing that I'd like to say is to end with a story specifically related to the private sector. And it relates to the banking industry, but it's relevant to all of the other sectors that we work with. So I, I was at a conference, and I presented to the American Banking Association. And this guy comes up afterwards and said, Mr. Friedman, I want to talk to you. I said, sure. Went off to the side. He says, I want to tell you a story. I was with my wife and my two teenage daughters, and we were going from one state to another. And about halfway to this other state, we stopped to go into a motel. I got my wife and my two daughters settled. I went out to get food, and I saw this 14-year-old girl being dragged into a room. And I knew it was forced prostitution and prostitution, and it was nefarious, and it was bad, and it really bothered me. I have teenage daughters. So I went to the manager, not knowing if anything was going to happen. She called the police. 20 minutes later, there was a police car there. 20 minutes later, this guy is being taken out in handcuffs. The girl's being taken away to the shelter. He said, this was a milestone in my life. It was one of the most important moments of my life because I really helped somebody. So I turned to him and I said, well, what do you do? He says, well, I'm in the banking world. I said, yeah, I get that. You're in a banking conference. But what do you do for the banks? And he said, I do anti-money laundering. I work on uh, corruption cases, fraud cases. I asked him if he ever did cases related to human trafficking. He said, yeah, all the time. I said, dude, you do this work all the time. Every time you basically do what you need to do, it helps to identify a criminal activity, and the possibility of that same outcome happening happens. He didn't make the connection between what he was doing and the relevance and importance of this. But once he had that in his mind, it was as important as when he helped that girl at the motel. Now, I told this story in Singapore in front, in front of a lot of bankers, and I had probably 20 people come up to me and say, nobody's really talked about the relevance and the importance of the work that we do in addressing modern slavery, but now we see it, and it makes us feel good. So whether you're working in a bank, whether you're working in a hotel, whether you're working in a retail site or a manufacturing site, if you are able to use your organizations and your skills and your procedures to identify forced labor and to address it, you are in fact contributing to making the world a better place. You are being heroic. 
And I want to emphasize this because the private sector has the potential to be major players in addressing this. And you can still make a profit, you can still do your work, you can still sell your products, but at the same time, you can ensure that people aren't being exploited in the workplace. And that's the importance of why we need to get in front of the private sector to help them to understand this issue so that they can address these things when they find it.